All right, here we go. Overdrive off and running. TSN 1050 on the TSN app. Your home smart speaker up on TSN 4. Brian Hazy, O'Dog, Jeff O'Neill, Jamie Noodles, McLennan, the Major League theme song. It's officially a thing of the past. (laughs) It's dead. It's It's not dead dead for now. Put it on hold. (laughs) It's on hold. Maybe the Raptors win the next two games, right? And they're up to five, and we play it for them. Who knows? We did the mood meter last week, Hazy B. I think we could do it every second day. Mm -hmm. I think the mood meter would have drastic changes every second day. Because, Noodles, you sat and watched one last night. Who do you think has more of a growl on this morning? Jacques Martin or Sheldon Keefe? Well, okay, I'm going to say Jacques Martin because not only did they – not not have a shot on goal in the third period and get That's outshot greasy, twenty man. to nothing. Outrageous! They that. they lost. That is, I don't you know how you do that. Team, but you you could see the team deflate. Like the Josh Norris injury, it, it's it's now now you're now you're concerned. Like you're you're looking at it going, if this is the kid's same shoulder, mm-hmm. thir- if he has to have surgery again, like you're you're looking at a twenty four year old here who's, you know, I, I, you're concerned bigger picture for this guy. And Noodles, I think I'll tell you what, that. I had labrum done, and as soon as you get it done, I had it done three times, and then two on the left side. It seems like, and I, I wish the kid all the best. We love him. He's a fan of the show. Yeah, he's but awesome, yeah. That, it seems like when it happens, it seems like after that it happens easily again, and I hope that's not the case for him. Just but happened to Drysdale. Three- the same thing, Jamie Drysdale. I don't know the extent yeah. of his injury, but it was the same thing. He got hit, his shoulder went limp, and... There's scary a kid. stuff. He's 21, I think. 21 years it, old. It is. It's really and you're troublesome. You're scared for that. And you, so that I would say Jacques Martin because Sheldon's coming off a seven game heater. Yeah. They came, you know, they came home, threw up a dud. I, I, it just wasn't their night. I, I knew it wasn't their night when the goalie lost the blade of his skate and was out of the net for about four seconds, and they still couldn't get the goal. I was like, okay, they're not doing it tonight. That was in the first period. Right. And you just felt like, okay, this isn't happening for them. But, yeah, I think it's shocked just based on there also were, was injuries. Stutzler hurt himself. Sanderson took a slap shot. Like, it was it was a mash unit last night. They couldn't get out of Nashville fast enough. I felt bad for them. That was crazy. Like, that statistic is wild. That's one that hangs on you. Right, like that one hangs around you for a while. That you went a full twenty minutes in the National Hockey League without registering a shot, so dude. It, like usually, somebody would be like, "Okay, guys, someone rip one from the red line just to get that zero. Right, off. give me a freebie. Like, give me something. Anyhow. Someone dump one in and register a shot so we get our shot twenty to one and we can move yes. on with our careers. Hey, he's twenty yeah. to one. Sounds so much better. It does. It does. I mean, it's yeah. a really wild statistic. You, I, I can't recall the last time that happened in the NHL. And, you know, Noodles, you were calling the game. I was watching the, the Leaf game. But if you look at the statistics, based on the shots, they were out shooting Nashville drastically through 40 minutes. It, at one point, there was – so they – the game was so crazy. <clears throat> they started – Nashville was all over them. Get up 2 nothing. The shots are 7 nothing for Nashville. Then Nashville didn't have a shot on goal – for like 16 minutes, and Ottawa took it to them and outshot them 17 to 1. Wow. So you're like, okay. But what happened is they gave up a dagger goal right at the end of the second period. It was 2 1. Hamannick falls down. Uh, Yossi comes in and scores. That makes it 3 1. They didn't recover. That was it. The Josh Norris injury, that goal, that was it. It was done. It's wild that you say that, Nerdos, because if, if you replaced Ottawa with Toronto, it was the exact same thing last night. Carlson makes it 3-1 late in a second, and it's like lights are out, done. You know, it's over. Like Bertuzzi had just yeah, that scored. Goal stunk. That it was a did. Bad it goal. wasn't a good goal, and there was no time left on the clock. Your big boys were on the ice. And you just got Mojo back. You and just, just had a, it. Well, look at that backhand was... pass. I can't stand it, and it's in the back of the net. Crazy stuff, Hayes. Yeah. Well, I saw you isolate that. I think you were talking about Brody earlier. That's Tavares, and, you know, Tavares knew what – what happened. He knew what he did. He knew he put himself in a bad spot, the team in a bad spot. And that effectively ended the game. And I think in terms of the mood meter, I, w- I would agree with you that I would I would go Martin 1, Keefe 2. But you guys have a lot of sources in this league. I wonder if we can get an anonymous referee to supply us with their seven coaching mood meter of the Canadian teams and the Canadian coaches because Sheldon Keefe yeah. – 
is he's he's going Pat Quinn, isn't he? Oh, like he used to always say Pat Quinn would <laughs> on puck drop would start yelling at these guys. And Keith is snapping almost every night. I know. And almost guess every what? night. I, I just I know he's been around a long time, but he still has got this vibe about him where it's just like every bad call, it's F you and you're screwing us. And I think referees will talk amongst each other and say, somebody's got to just throw this guy out and enough's enough. And I understand there's a lot of stress in that job and he's a passionate guy and he understands in this market, working over the refs and then calling them over after the period Maybe it'll get their attention. Like, there's ways of using the Toronto angle to your advantage, but it just seems like right. every game he's teeing off on these guys. And I think they're like, Pat Quinn, that guy was doing it when he was 60 years old. Mm-hmm. Like, he'd be, yeah. don't talk to the refs, drop the puck. <laughs> you're, a, you're a joke. <laughs> a coward. <laughs> yeah, a coward. You're a coward on a bad yeah. puck drop. <laughs> right yeah. after the drop. Carrie Frazier, you're a coward. And I'm like, he just told us not to yell at the refs. Right. But, but anyway, this guy's got more of a, like, I hate your guts to the ref type of vibe. And I think it just got to a point. Who threw him out? Garrett Rank? Yeah, well, Rank yeah. was the one he was going out last night. Yeah. And, and listen, they, I didn't think they had a good night at all. Don't get me I think he had a legitimate No, they beef. stunk the joint out. And the myth continues of why you come home after a great road trip and stink in that first game. Right. They were swimming. They were in quicksand. They had nothing cooking. And that's what was so disappointing about that Tavares goal because they just got themselves into the hockey game. It's like there's some juice right there going into the second. And in a split second, it was gone. And then they went into the third, yeah. and it was like it sucked the life right out of them. Yeah, it it speaks to how tough it is to get on a heater like Edmonton had where they won 16 in a row. When you consider what Boston did last year, it doesn't even make sense. You know, like the Leafs won seven in a row and they lose last night and it's a very predictable loss. You know, Vegas is a good team. Vegas realized they got to get hungry. Like Vegas has got to get cooking here as we're almost into March and they can't rest on, well, we got injury problems. They got to show up and other guys got to play like Carlson, like Marcia, so like we saw last night. And, yeah. you know, the Leafs were, were pretty flat. And my understanding is, you know, my dad was in the building. He said there was some some buzz early. People were excited they were home, you know, when Bertuzzi scored. And really it was that Carlson 3-1 goal that was a complete dagger, completely yeah. deflated everything. And as for Keefe, you know, he's he has been around, but not long enough. You know, there, there, is, there is politics and relationship building that comes with the officials. Like Pat Quinn, by the time he was – you know, when he was the, the coach of the Leafs in 06, Pat Quinn had been in the NHL for like 45 years. No one right. was ever going to disrespect him. No one was ever going to throw him out. And no ref was going to hold anything against him and say, I'm, I'm going to get you because you just yelled at me for a bad puck drop. No and one back was in those do days, Hayes, there was more of a back and forth where a ref might say, F you too. Right, and exactly. It, it, and it was yeah, It's not like that right. anymore. Now these refs, you can say whether you like it or not. It's like, don't talk to me like that. And right. that's fine. That's just the way it goes now. But he's got he's got I, I, to tone it down a little bit. Like no it's, kidding. It's, it's too much. It's it it it's like he's losing his composure back there. The way he's going at the refs, the, the optics of it, it makes it look like if you were a ref, you would want to look at him and say, "Who do who do you think you are talking right. to me like yeah, that?" Now that's how it comes you guys, across. You're, you're you're right. I when I first saw it, uh, I here's what I thought, and you guys tell me. Maybe I'm completely off base, but the Leafs had. We'll call it like kind of a stinker of a game. What are we talking about? We're talking about the coach. I feel like he might have, like it almost may have been calculated, like I'm going to take a bullet for ah, these guys. Because, like that's, ah, honestly, it may be I'm thought, completely interesting wrong. Interesting thought. Dude, because if we're he not did, talking he's a about, genius. we're not talking about Samsonov not looking sharp, you know, uh, Riley and Brody. Like, you know, we're not breaking down. It, yes, we talked about the Tavares giveaway, all of that type of stuff. We will get to the game. But the number one story was the coach got thrown out at the end of the game. The game was over. Mm-hmm. And he made a, you know, who knows what he said, back backhanded comment, whatever. You're right. Like, all of these things that you've laid out, I'm not disagreeing with you. But in my mind, there were times, and you, you I, I've seen Daryl Sutter do it. I've seen other coaches do it where it's like, I everyone's going to be talking about my team's underperformance. And I'm just going to take a bullet for them tonight. And, and you know, maybe on some layer he did that. I don't know because I thought it was a weird toss. Like, it, it 
I don't know what he said. You couldn't read lips, and I. I it, we have you know, a pretty good idea out. of what he was saying. Yeah, a couple he didn't like the Marner, and Marner that. call in particular. I think he deserved right. to be pissed off. the The penalties were 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 really you know steep in the direction of Vegas. the The Leafs, I I do think there's something a little bit deeper. I think that's a really interesting theory noodles and I think you might be onto something that happens a lot in baseball games 10 one a manager's like I'm gonna go lose my mind in the eighth yeah, get tossed I, and then everyone's gonna yeah. buzz about that and I think if there was any strategy in it from that standpoint I, I think that's a really smart plan I think his, his team deserved that because of the way they had been playing but the Leafs I think you look at what happened with the Riley suspension you look at what happened yeah. with the Matthews suspension, and Sheldon basically said, we feel like we get treated differently. And if you look at the history since Peros took over, they're the most suspended team in the league, which is crazy. And they get... Considering the, how they play it Considering is. how they play, and, and they draw the least amount of, of penalties. Like, I think they're like 26th or 27th. You look over the last, like, decade, they're always 27, 28, in terms of them going on the power play. Remember the stats last year? Where they didn't have a five on three, like at any point, and I I think the Leafs are aware of that. I guarantee you they're aware of it, and I think they feel as if the the whistle goes the other way more often than it should. And whether that's justified or not, I think it's difficult to make those arguments. Last night, when you consider they were flat, they didn't play well, and even when Marner got that penalty, it was four two, I believe. Reeves had just scored. You're still really climbing uphill. Like the likelihood of getting back yeah. in the game is really, really unlikely at that point. But it's one thing to be sarcastic, you know, to to protest. Keith seems to legitimately get like furious with the refs. You know, like I don't know if yeah. he's got a different switch. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like there have been coaches over yep. the course of history. Paul Maurice is great at it. Maurice will give you the he'll give you the sarcastic wave or a sarcastic comment or a, a smirk or a laugh, and then, like, Keith, had, I think, has one gear, and it's, pedal I'm going to the nuts. Metal. Yeah, it's, it's pedal it's to the snap. metal, yeah, and snap. I'm going to snap. And I think it probably would be in his best interest to find a different gear. I, there's, that's never going to – this has always been around in sports. It always will be. Coaches, managers, they hate on the refs, and they always feel like they're getting screwed. Every coach feels that way. Every team well, feels that way. There, that's every team in every sport with every single official – but there's different ways you can play it, and I think you know for Keith, it's probably in his best interest to find a different gear, or or maybe take your foot yeah. off the pedal every once in a while, and don't floor it, you know, when you you feel no, like I, the whistles aren't going your way. I get that. Remember, it wasn't it in Toronto. Paul Maurice had the meltdown on the called back goal, but remember he did that the hand signal. It was like five zero or whatever. Like didn't remember yeah. it was on his chest. He was like five zero. Like that's what uh, that's what the penalties are right now for the Leafs. Like and then he yelled at his team, but they everyone attributes to the turnaround. That's where Alex Lyon went on that run and all of that. Like it's all right for a coach to strategically press the button or I'm gonna I'm gonna lose it here. Uh, you're right. Like I think there is a fine line, but I I I, I just I, I look at Sheldon, and I think he's pretty composed back there, but he's intense. Like, I played he's against intense. him. Oh, I think you played against him. Like, he was a fiery player. Yep. The guy's yeah. guy got, you know, he's got some jam to him. And, you right. know, he, it, you, you've got to have some restraint. But I, I was fine. I don't know why I'm fine with it. Maybe I shouldn't have no, been. But it I doesn't just, matter. I, I, don't get me yeah. wrong. Yeah. Let's, not, let's, like, not, let's not, like, totally excuse the referees here, guys. Yeah, this the refs year, were not I'm, good last night either. The, there's been a lot, and refing has been – Brought up in a lot of leagues. My boy Monty Williams, he was pissed the other night because the Knicks were playing the Pistons and a garbage call at the end of the game that was should have been a foul. And Monty Williams was like, I just can't believe this. Yeah. Like that he was, was a joke. pissed, man. That, that was, was a, a joke. joke. That was so a joke. The coaches are under so much stress to get wins. And when a call like that happens against the Knicks, watch this. You're telling me this isn't like Hayes, I don't know what the hell is this call right here. It's a foul. Well, it's a blatant. He's out of control. It's it's further up, close to the the halfway, but or the half court. We're explaining it on radio. Right there. But this is it. That's yeah. a foul. He gets in his way. He he intrudes yeah. him, and 
that's a classic. It's the Knicks at the Garden against a joke of a franchise. We're not calling. Well, that. you're right, but you anyway, know, we're getting off happened. track here with that. Getting into that. That was game. two nights ago. I don't need to say. I retract that statement. Shout out to the Detroit yeah. Pistons. I was just saying, you watch yourself here. <laughs> not uh, a joke, was, not a joke he's historically. My God. He's not my guy. It's only for... <laughs> right. But this the bottom line good. is the refs have been in question a lot, and they just seem to weasel out the back door. As much as I like Garrett Rank and all the NHL officials, they go out the back door and got no explanation for nothing. And there's some garbage calls, ticky-tack calls all over the place, and the consistency is kind of gone. And the idea of not knowing what you're going to get night to night, that's a problem. I- I, I, but you know what it comes back to, and this this might be the old school in me. I preferred refs managing the game, letting them play. Like I've it seen, it seems like they're year. out there looking to call penalties. That call for, on for, Marner is not a penalty in any league at any time of the game. That's a joke. Like that's a joke of a call, and it it's not a Leaf player or former player pissing and moaning. That's just not a penalty in the National Hockey League at any time. At yeah, any time it, ever. You're right. It goes, and, and, and we see it every night, regardless of the, the jersey or whatever. But I, I, for the most part, I've been always pro-ref because I think that they have a hard job to do. But I, I go back to it is we've asked, you got to call everything. Call a slash and call it, you know, don't manage the game. You, you got to just, if you have to penalty, you got to call it. I would much rather manage the situation, manage the game and go, hey, you know what? That's not a penalty. You let them play. You know, if it's if it's taking away a scoring chance, if it's a an egregious punch to the face and stuff, that's where the refs step in and make sure things don't get under out of control. But you know, we we I don't know where you stand on this, Hayes, but we've been well. Every, it's gotten to a point where it's it's everything they believe they got to call everything. Where it's I would much rather there's a penalty every shift. So you're going to blow a penalty every yeah, shift. Yeah, that's or you're the, manage the game. Yeah, I mean that again gets back to where I stand on on the review process. I mean this is right. all steeped in the same conversation that. You can find Human something error. on every single play. Exactly. So if you want to, sh- if you want to stop every play and break it down, mistakes are going to happen. It's at a high pace. Generally, I'm a believer that over the course of the year, it evens out, right? Because I'm sure yep. you could go back and find clips where there was a call made or a call that wasn't made that probably that I know would have benefited the Leafs. So every team in the league, if they win, they're happy. If they lose, they feel like they got screwed, right? And and yep. Keith Keith addressed it today he came back to the well and said we didn't earn our penalties that was basically his assessment of the game we weren't good enough last night right they weren't yeah. like they, if you're flat chances are the whistle's going to go the other way and if the other team's playing better than you chances are they're going to get more breaks and more calls and the human instinct in an official is those guys have the puck they're playing harder that's where the call's going to go it's never going to be perfect you know, all you can ask yeah. for is in the biggest games, you walk away from the game and say, you know what? I didn't even notice the ref. That's the best right. case scenario. Yeah. That's what we saw in the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl was no not factor. flag happy. There weren't a lot of flag. No one even talked about the refs. It just, it played out. It was a good game. You moved on. And that's generally the assessment of officiating is it's either I don't care because I didn't notice or I really cared because I hated it. Right? There's yeah. no, man, I was really watching that ref. He was great last night. What a great, <laughs> great call. Like, that never happens. It's either yeah. I don't care because it was fine or I care because I hated it. And generally, it's going to be based on how you feel your team, you know, got either screwed over last night or possibly got propped up. And, again, I, I do think there is something with this Leaf organization. I think they have a legitimate gripe in some areas. I really do. The Riley suspension is a good example of that. Uh, the Jason Spezza suspension back in the day where he got six games and he had never been suspended before. He was, you know, the, the gentleman of the sport, like basically Mr. Lady Bing out there. Same thing with Riley. Same thing with Matthews when he got his two game on Darlene. So all these suspensions, you know, they, they're they a, a high octane offense that puts up a ton of puck possession numbers and offensive numbers. And yet they don't seem to go on the power play a lot. I think the Leafs legitimately have a gripe, but I don't think it's in their best interest to allow that to show up, you know, to allow that to, to affect you. I mean, you guys can speak to it more when you're on the bench. Like if you have a coach that's more composed, more fiery, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it comes down to the makeup of your team, the DNA of your team. Maybe it's Sheldon saying, I'm not hearing enough guys on the bench yelling and screaming. So Dude, I'll yell and scream. It's a mix. Lavi was, Lavi was great at it because he was like, sometimes Lavi first shift, like puck drops, 
other team dumps it in to get after it, and Lavi would be looking like a hawk, and it would be two inches away from the red line. He would be yelling at the linesman for off or uh, icing, right? It, yeah. And it would just be like it kind of got your attention because you're like, our coach is that fired up off the opening face off. The other team dumps it in, and he's pissed off at the line. He's engaged. He's ready to rock, right? But just teeing off on the red, it just gets old for everybody. And when you're a player, you're just sitting there, and you're like, can you shut up, man? Like, that's just enough. Mm-hmm. And you have to have wow. a balance where it can be counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah. Counterintuitive. counterintuitive. That's counterintuitive. a good one. And I waiting. think you've worked it properly, but you haven't landed it yet. What is, what is counterintuitive? Land it. What are we doing? Because <laughs> he's just it. pissing off the refs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he's just pissing off the refs, and they're just like, screw this guy. And the players are thinking, we're getting jammed up here for the calls like last night because our coach is yelling behind the bench, the bench like that. Yeah, it, it can be counterproductive as well. It was. You nailed it. You That's nailed it. <laughs> nailed it. Nailed the landing. You nailed it. Out of we were waiting, it. though. That were, there was a pregnant pause. Dude, I, I'm, I'm like, not oh kidding. God, I said there? that word, and I started sweating bullets. And I'm like, <laughs> counterintuitive. I've never said that word before in my life. And then I'm like, I don't even know if this makes sense. You and I know Hayes is a word freak. And I'm like, I got to just – I was yeah. thinking about just letting it fly, but I'm like – do you seem dumber if you start going with it and it doesn't make sense? Or right. I, I like don't know. The, the pregnant pause on a great word. We got to we got to establish that more. Drop a great word, let it breathe, yeah. and then you land. Just it. Let it breathe. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I agree though. Being on those benches and even in between the benches, there are certain coaches that are more lively, more talkative. Other coaches just kind of sit back there and just kind of take it all in. But there is a timing factor to all of this and i like i say last night i don't mind a coach on a night where his team doesn't have it didn't like a call he's going to challenge it but you know you can't make a habit of it you're right you get a reputation of that people are like i I, you know what refs are like i'm not getting they're human too i'm not going to deal with this guy again screaming at me every night so there's a fine line you got to pick your spot sheldon picked this spot last night the trap game of all trap games waiting for you tomorrow you, know, you got they, Arizona they, here they, exactly with, with New York on Saturday, Boston on Tuesday. You're right. Like, and the Coyotes are going to roll in. They lost again last night. Like, thirteen in a row. Thirteen in a Jesus. row. It's That's the last do, thing man. you want to see. Exactly is thirteen in a row rolling through town. But you know, it's on the Leafs to prove that they can overcome that ultimately, and they should. They'll be a massive favorite. Dude, they have go to prove. It's just like trying to get your ass in shape. Okay, you get a new routine, and the Leafs have had a new routine the past couple of weeks. They play different. They look different. But sometimes you just go in that cupboard and you grab a bag of chips. Last night they grabbed a bag of chips. But tomorrow, no more chips. Back on the program. I like it. Cheat cheat day All yesterday. Right. It was a cheat day. Was a cheat <laughs> you just day. cheated. You got off the program, and you just saw something. Your barrel was hanging out, yeah. and you wanted a bag of Cheetos. And you grabbed it. Nothing wrong with that. Cheat days. I did not cheat this morning. I hit the gym. I was in there wow. moving and shaking. Yeah. What was your? Give me the full workout today. I, I got to admit, it was soft. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a great one. I've I've had a lot on my plate. Busy. I was taking calls, which can be distracting. I need to pause. I need to like put an hour and a half aside and turn my phone off and go in there. The phone is way too distracting. So it was a treadmill. Um. 30 a minute. run or a walk? It's kind of a fast uphill walk, Noodles. Nice. It was yeah, it was it was good. a it was like a walk. It was a half walk, walk half <laughs> jog. You know, I was walking <laughs> at Planet Fitness today and put in 30. I did double down on the hydro massage. <laughs> I did go back out for another 10 minutes, what are you talking which is about? shocking. A this is a sitting in a chair. Man, this is it's getting, it's sitting well, in a chair with payoff. water. I mean, I, I put a work in. Dude, I you're Roger Dorn at the Indian Spring Training. Like, it's yeah, a joke. I I'll know. tell you what, I got terrorized on the treadmill today. The, the really fit dude that runs like a machine, he was walking beside me warming up before our lift. And I said, let me ask you something. If you were going to do a 5K, like a 35, 40-minute run, I started thinking, how, how long does it take to run 5K? I don't even know. I said, on the treadmill, what level would you do it at? And he goes, oh, something like that, 10, level 10. I go, what? I go, level 10 is an outright. That's like, a sprint. That's yes. a full-out sprint. 
Yeah. And I thought he was joking, but he wasn't. He's like, I would do that at level 10 for sure, 9 or 10. And I'm like, that's insane. Yeah, that's heroic, man. That's unnecessary. you got to stop talking uh, with people like that. They're, they're uh, you're right. in a different world. Well, I know, but, but keep you, in mind. You have nothing in you common just, with that guy. You, nothing. You just said 30, 35 minutes. Keep in mind, 5K for guys like that, they will run that in like 15 minutes. Yeah. Because that's three 15 miles. Fifteen minutes. Run, You're right. Pe- people run six minute miles, five minute miles, like that type of stuff. Like that's three miles, just over three miles. Like that's what these guys run at. Yeah. Like is a, a six minute mile or way better. Like there's, you know, I'm talking that we that's used like to have a marathon, run, run a six, six minute. minute mile. Like if you're running yeah, like, over 26 miles, you're doing it at that number. You're you're feeling exactly. great. You're talking like record book stuff. But yeah. you're right. When we ran our 10K, man, someone was – I think someone did that in like 32 minutes or, or something yeah. crazy. But like, it wasn't 10. It was 5. I'm pretty sure it was I think five. we did 10. I'm pretty sure we did 10. We had to do I 10. I don't know. It was 10. I, I, I think it was, it was 10. 10. That's why There's no way we did 5 in like an hour and 20. <laughs> Dude, an hour was twenty. I was two forty-five. <laughs> <laughs> then the guy gets on the megaphone. And he's like, "Here comes the old dog and a two forty. I wanted to just drill that guy. I'm well, like, you, you think you needed to announce stops. me coming across the finish line? <laughs> yeah, with the pace the car Starbucks right up my rear point. end. Yeah, I know that was that was unnecessary. <laughs> yeah, we did a ten k. It was a hundred percent a ten k. Yeah. All right, uh, uh, Bruce Bujo coming up. On Sheldon Keep behind a bench, among other things, what he saw last night. Morgan Riley on the right side last night. How he felt about that. John Tavares playing, you know, on the third line. We've got Scott Hartnell coming up. The Oilers are in action tonight. We saw a bunch of games in the NHL last night. And also the Rangers are back at the Garden. Matt Rempe playing at the Garden tonight for the Rangers as Columbus is in town, which means Olivia. I'm all in. Is I'm in all town. in Columbus yeah. Rangers tonight. I am as well. I'm looking forward to this game. Uh, so that more coming up with Scotty Hartnell. We've got uh, role play level of concern in about an hour. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 4. Overdrive continues. Brought to you by FanDuel. Bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. We've got Luca and the Mavs in town tonight. Raps had, I'm assuming, had their pizza party last night. They certainly should have. I mean, Darko promised that after three straight. They go for four straight tonight. And now they got the longest streak going in the city. Right after the Leafs lost last night to Vegas, the Leafs are back in action tomorrow night. And to chat about what we saw out of the Leafs last night, among many other things league-wide, here's one of our favorites, longtime Maple Leaf himself, Marley himself, head coach, and obviously uh, NHL analyst. Here's Bruce Boudreau. How you doing, Bruce? I'm doing well today. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. We just were discussing uh, the antics of Sheldon Keefe last night, his relationship with the referees around the league. He got tossed last (laughs) night. You don't see that too often. Um, When you're watching that as a coach yourself, uh, what's running through your mind? You know, I mean, well, it happens. You get mad. And, I mean, it was when uh, the call before that put the Leafs on a penalty, uh, it was, was pretty apparent that uh, I don't think Bertuzzi did anything. Um, and so the frustration gets going. And uh, and you know what? It takes one trigger word for the refs. Like, you can get away with a lot of stuff, but sometimes you say one trigger word, and that steps them off, and out you go. <laughs> and that's how it works. How do you find the balance, Brucey? I mean, you want to be... You want to let your players know, I mean, I imagine you would, that you're engaged and you're you're ready to rock every night, but there's got to be a point where you're just becoming a distraction almost and a disadvantage because the referees are just going to be like, I can't stand listening to this guy's yell. So you yeah, want to you work them a little bit and let them know that you're looking for a call in the next period or whatever, but it, the, how do you find the balance as a coach? Well, I mean, it's the one thing I learned from being a young coach to when you get some experiences uh, is when you start yelling a lot behind the bench, then the players think it's okay for them to do it. And oh, they, yeah. they lose, they lose their control. And I mean, it's always been that like the saying, you have to keep your head about you while others around you are losing theirs. But uh, I mean, if, yes, if I'm, if, if that's a good thing, right? Yes. If, uh, very if well done. <laughs> very well. If I, if I'm coaching and I'm screaming, that almost gives permission for the players to start screaming. So, I mean, 
especially at the end of my ten years, you see me pretty calm behind the bench, un- unless there's moments where you have to back the players. And I, th- you know what, I think this started on the whole uh, O'Reilly thing. And um, now Sheldon's just, you know, he-, he thinks he's backing his players and getting mad when when uh, injustices are done to them. And uh, uh, he went a little bit overboard. And like I said, you can say those words. I mean, and when it starts to get personal to the referee, that's when he'll toss you. You know, like, uh, uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, Paul Dvorsky used to be my next-door neighbor and uh, in, in Hershey and when I was coaching in Washington. And he'd tell me, he said, you know what? He said, you can say anything you want to me. I won't, I won't toss you. I won't do anything. You know, so... Don't worry, because this is how we talk now, and and uh, I, I will toss you. So the one game he goes and makes a really bad call, and I go, I go, Paul Devo, that's a effing brutal call, and he turns around and he starts giving it back to me, and I start giving it back to him, and the players on the bench are grabbing me. You're going to get kicked out. You're going to get kicked out, and then and then eventually he leaves with a little smile on his face, and I said, "Don't worry about it, boys. We had this thing all planned out." <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> but, but I mean, you, you got to get the relationships with the refs before you start doing that. Like, I mean, in the, at the end of my tenure in Vancouver, I had a pretty good relationship with all the refs and, but I would talk way more calmly figuring you can get a lot more with sugar than you can with vinegar rather than screaming at them because. They're human beings, and if you start screaming at them all night long, they're not going to give you a break at all. Bruce, if, if you ever had uh, maybe a calculated, we'll call it a calculated meltdown, where maybe your team wasn't playing well, or or you wanted to get a reaction or let the team know you had their back, so you know it was, I would say maybe kind of a fake one, or you know, was that basically what yep. you uh, just described with Dvorsky? But if you had those, and do you believe that coaches do that to draw, draw attention away from maybe their team's performance? Yeah, I mean, you, um, you, yeah, and I have had it, and. And, but you can't do it all the time. You got to really make sure that maybe the team is going on a little bit of a um, a down down streak. They're they're not winning. They're not playing. They're not playing with any uh, excitement. And you either have it on the bench or in the room. And I figure you can do three of those in the room a year before it starts going in one ear and out the other. But if you and if it's something that that your players think, oh, that's not. Uh, how he normally acts, then I think it really it resonates with them and they react to it. I mean, the last thing you want to do is have a meltdown in between periods and then come out and stinking even more. Because I mean, if that if that happens, then you're going, oh man, like I mean, they're not paying any attention to me. They don't know how serious I am about this. So I mean, and I I've been pretty lucky that when you t- uh, you time it and you plan it out and you you see what's happening. And it, it usually has worked, but you can't do it often. If you do it often, it's like your mom or your dad telling you, clean up your room, clean up your room. After a while, it goes in one ear and out the other, and you just say, forget it. I'm going to get yelled at or screamed at anyway, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Brucey, what's your take on teams 95% of the time stinking the joint out first game at home after a, an out, like a, out west road trip, west coast road trip or a long trip? Why do they stink at home the first game? Well, if it's a long trip, I mean, I don't know, I, to first of all. But this is what I always think is as soon as you walk in the door, if you've got a young family you, and your wife's been alone with the kids the whole full time, they, they're handing them to you at the door saying, I need a break. It's all yours. I like we're on the road. You've just got you, your hotel, and everything else. And, I mean, you guys all know it. You've all played. And when you come home and uh, uh, there's an awful lot going on and you usually have maybe one day, maybe two at the most of having off before you play. And, uh, it, and you find that when you've left, the, uh, it, when you left home for a week and you've come back, there's just so many things to do that your focus isn't on hockey. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's the only explanation I can, I can, uh, think about it because i think every player is is used to the time changes and now yeah you might not get as much sleep or you get too much sleep but it's still i mean uh 
come game day, you've got your routine. You you do what you normally do. So I find a hard time believing that it's it's time zone changing and everything else. But I do believe that if you've got a family, it uh, uh, it can become uh, doing an awful lot of stuff for a day and a half before uh, instead of focusing on the game. With Bruce Boudreaux, we saw uh, Morgan Riley playing the right side last night. Which generally, when he's with Brody, it's you know it's flipped, and uh, you know he didn't look very comfortable. It it didn't look great last night. That pairing, there's something up with those two. They played so much together the last four and a half years. Don't play them ever again together. It's very simple. Like yeah, well that's it. I mean, Bruce, wow, I guess you answer that. I mean, those those are two of your your three or four best defensemen. They have a rich history together. How do how do you see the Riley Brody scenario playing out? Well, you know what? It, sometimes guys are not comfortable on the right side. But I, you know, uh, Ryan Suter was a great player for many years. He's still at 39 years old, still playing pretty well in um, Dallas. But he hated the right side. I always had to keep him on the left side. And I mean, if I'd move him over there, he'd come to me the next day and say, "I can't play the right side. I can't play the right side." So I'd push him back on the left side and pull somebody else out there. But it's. Uh, um, so maybe maybe Morgan like that that he's so used to playing the left side he can't play the right side. Why they switched I have no idea because um, uh, Brody's been playing the right side since he was in Calgary, and uh, so I, I don't know the answer to that one. But I can picture that they're saying, okay, we got six lefties uh, playing tonight. I'm going to put my best puck handler, my best puck mover on the right side, and it just. Uh, it didn't work as well as they expected it to. Yeah, something's going to have to give there, I guess, at some point. And, you know, it's still there's still enough time. they got 23 games left. They're, they're well into a playoff spot. They, they've been moving the lineup around a little bit, obviously, like we just referenced, Riley playing on the right side, Brody staying on the left, John Tavares on the third line, John Tavares not on the first power play unit. You know, I, I know you're aware of it, Bruce. A lot of people buzzing about that in this town because – it's just something that has never been a reality for Tavares when he's been a Leaf, an Islander, a London Knight, a Oshawa General, a Toronto Marley. It didn't matter. You go back, you know, 30 years, this guy's never been on the third line. Um, if you were running the show there, is that something you, you'd keep coming back to him about and continue to talk to him about? Or do you just, you know, you're honest with him, you say you're going on this line, you're coming off PP1, and that's it. I'll tell you when something changes. Well, first of all, he's your captain, so you, there has to be a really good line of communication. I'm sure there is between Sheldon and him. So I'm sure they talk about it all the time. I'm sure Sheldon went up to him and told him, this is my thought, this is what do you think, because in the end, two lines uh, don't win in, in the playoffs. You have to have three. You look at Vegas, look at the last you know, umpteen winners of the Stanley Cup. They have four lines going so, I mean, maybe they're thinking, okay, we've got to get a little more balance. All our scoring's coming from the, the top two lines, and or most of it. I mean, in this seven-game uh, streak, uh, Max is, is scoring and Bertuzzi started scoring. But, I mean, you need three and four lines. And I think in the end, like uh, even Riley, uh, where they started off, uh, if memory serves, ended up playing on the third line last year or – and I thought they're a stronger team when you have three solid centers and uh, instead of loading up on two lines. So maybe that was the thought process. But I am sure the conversations took place, and John was well aware of it and, and almost gave his permission. Like, I'm sure he would have said something like, uh, hey, whatever's best for the team, Sheldon, I'll do, you know, because that's the kind of person he is. But, I mean, uh, uh I didn't check today, but I didn't know if his minutes were a lot down by playing in that spot. And being the second man on, on the power play unit or being in the second unit, your minutes really go down if there's a lot of penalties because the first unit, uh, especially on great teams like Toronto, who has a great power play, they're, they're on for a minute and 40, maybe even longer uh, on a lot of occasions. Bruce, uh, sliding over to the NHL, I mean, the rest of the league, what do you make of the New York Rangers playing Columbus tonight and everyone wanting to focus in to see if the kid fights again? I mean, can his face take it again? Like, I mean, <laughs> that poor, I mean, I, I know one thing. I was at the NHL Network last night. I was 
uh, as a fan, I was excited to see what might might happen. Um, uh, and I hope the uh, Ranger fans, and I'm pretty sure they will, will give this guy uh, a, a pretty good cheer because he's standing up for his teammates like that. But man, that's uh, it, he's like the 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 new gun in town, and every tough guy in the world is looking for him um, to see how good he is. And that uh, uh, Olivier gave him a pretty good, like I mean, even Deloria, they they were. They were throwing, and I would never have wanted to get involved in the middle of that stuff. But I mean, he's got. I'm sure the veterans on that team said, "Hey, guy, pick your spots." You know, like I mean, you can't do this every game. You'll never last. And uh, uh, I know you guys uh, know. Uh, I played with Mick Vakoda in the minors his first year, and he was trying to to to, to really get himself going. And he he fought in 22 straight games. Uh, in, in when we were in Springfield together wow. before he we went up with the Islanders. And I know I had to come up to him and say, Mick, hey, man, you, you can't do this every night. you got to play or you're never going to, you know, you'll never make it here forever. You'll never make it. To, so, I mean, he started playing. He was better. But uh, this guy's going to be a fan favorite. I can tell you that. We walk in, if he scores a couple more goals and does what he's doing, uh, the Ranger fans will just love this guy. There is no question about that, and we'll see. I, I'm with you. I think the the fans of the Garden tonight, it's going to be loud. There'll be a bunch of Rempe jerseys already. I'll bet you scattered yeah. throughout the oh, Garden yeah. tonight. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and enjoy the games tonight, Bruce. Appreciate you doing this, as always. But I will. All right, you guys have a great day. You too. There's uh, Bruce Boudreaux. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Rangers Columbus tonight i i worry about the kid a bit like you're right like i mick vakota i played with him in new york tough as nails but like he was you know oh you guys know this too like you, some of these tough guys are built like they're, they're thick like tony twist was six feet two 250 like mm -hmm. i think this kid is really long and lean and well, still just growing look at his, his eye like, at doesn't one age. of the trainers or the medical people say if that gets punched again you could be in big time trouble here I mean, yeah. I mean, fighters might say it's just a black eye. It's not swollen. It's just a black eye. Mm. So I don't know what the hell this kid does, but that's an interesting dynamic. If somebody, if Olivier goes up to him and says, you want a piece again to try to get back into this, and what does he say? Does he say, I got a black eye, I'm not allowed to fight? I know they, they have done that in the past where somebody's got an injury, a hand, mm. whatever, yeah. but it'll be fascinating to see how he, I'm pretty sure that if he wasn't going to fight tonight, he would have he said something. Like he would have said, I just, I, I, the, the, with my eye, I can't do it tonight. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. If, it's a good question. I mean, I think his teammates probably have an idea of what's coming. I also, you know, we all know that not every fight is equal. Like there is something called a seatbelt in fighting where it's like, you know what? Yeah. I'm going to drop the gloves, yeah. but this doesn't have to be a throwing bombs competition. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. I'm going to hold on, tangle up. Yeah. And you, st it's still a fight. You still said I'm going, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And may he needs to mix in. I'll bet you, you know, like the streak that Bujo just referenced 22 games in a row, not to cheapen that at all. I guarantee you a handful were. Gloves off, grab, wrestling. You know, it's like, okay, we're done here. I'm willing to go anybody. Yeah. No one's going to push me around. You can't have every single fight bombs. Like, you just – you can't – no fighters ever had that. It's not possible. At some point, yeah. it's got to be a spontaneous, quick tilt, grab each other, go down, see you later, over. And I could picture that tonight where even he – Rempe, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of, is like, all right, I got to get out of Olivier. I'm going to get him quick, and I'm just going to try to – seatbelt and get down mm -hmm. you know and then it's it's a fight i want him again place will go nuts you move i love on. how yeah. everyone's referencing it is all the tough guys around the league like there's 30 of them or something uh, there's not yeah. there's not yeah, many but no. there's still when enough, they say man. all the people want to get at this guy what are we talking about a five pack of players it's probably a five to ten pack maybe, maybe maybe that can tangle with this guy yeah yeah that's true i, I, I mean that's true yeah yeah, there were there are guys who can handle themselves or fight, but they're the traditional 
tough guy's gone. You have to be able to play. That's what makes this kid like this kid can skate. Like he can move and he can and he's physical and you know he can score. Like he's he's actually been really good. Like you know we played in the era of the the traditional tough guy. Right. Like I I remember playing with this guy Christoph Olawa. I don't yeah, know if course. you remember that name. Of course. I want to say I I'd have to check this out, but I I swear he fought north of thirty times one year when when I played with him, mm-hmm. and those were like. He was fighting LaRock. He was fighting that Steve McIntyre and Evan. Yeah, like they had, there were some monsters the in the boys. league. Yeah, there was like yeah. monsters. But he fought, I want to say he fought like 33 times one year, yeah. which is insane. That, it, it's it crazy. Is, it is crazy. It is. All right, Scott Hartnell on this and much more coming up in about 20 minutes. Overdrive continues, TSN 1050 and on the TSN app. All right, every day we announce a current or former Maple Leaf player, and by the end of the week, if you call in and name all five players for the Leafs lineup, you're going to see a future Leaf game. This week, it's tickets to see the Leafs Bruins March 4th. That is a big one. Plus, we're throwing in a $250 Vanilla Visa prepaid card. Vanilla Visa prepaid cards are available for purchase at Petro Canada. Today's player of the day is Tom Fitzgerald. Tom Fitzgerald. Of the New Jersey Devils. They laid a beating on San Jose last night. Like basically everyone does. That's um, San Jose, yeah. man. I don't. That's, years away. that's a problem, years. dude. Yeah. Light years away from being competitive. <laughs> and I, I guess, you know, Logan Couture, that's all he's ever known. You know, he wants to stay. You know, he seems committed there, but I don't know, man. That's they, They've yeah. done a lot of losing. A lot of well, losing. Well, the other guy, Pickles. Vlasic's been there his whole career. Since yeah. He was like 18. Right. He's I don't like even think he plays now. anymore. He's still got well, term I, I, left on his deal. Oh, I think he's yeah. got a couple tons years of, left. Tons of cake for him. Yeah. Left. And Carlson scores the OT winner last night in Vancouver, which, you know, he got out and Pitt, they're, you know, they're staying in it. They're hanging around. They're hanging, they're hanging around. around. Sid was unbelievable last night. We'll get into yeah. that in the next hour. Like, Sid's got an opportunity to. I think to steal the Hart Trophy or get in on it, possibly. Let's talk about possibly. it. They made the playoffs. Yeah, that would be possibly. Let's talk about it. Hour two coming up. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app.